And I think the herbal community tends to be on the kind side, yeah. but the quirky side, yeah. um, often thoughtful. And so when I go to something like this, like I get overwhelmed with a lot of people around me, sure. and but it's still like good people to feel overwhelmed around. Like right. I could probably just say that because I've been in other situations where it just feels tight and talking to people feels very struggling. Yeah. And I would say the herbal community, I mean, you would know this well because yeah. you, know, you interview people and just meet a lot of people. Yeah. But I think the thing that I like most about the herbal community um, is the community. And I've just That's been, you know, it's just been a lot of years. And so, you know, I mean, coming from like a street urchin by meaning a brat background and, you know, having this group of people that help support me intellectually and, but also not, not try to get confined into like, you know, uh, into a square person in a square, a square hole. Or it doesn't make sense, whatever a square hole is called. <laughs> Welcome to the Herbalist Hour. This is where community gather, merging the power of people and the flowers, the sweets and the bitter to the salty, the sour. Oh, mommy, it's time for the Herbalist Hour. Well, welcome back to the Herbalist Hour. Today I'm joined by Seven Song here at the Great Lakes Herb Fair. What an awesome, amazing event. Actually, last time I was here, you were teaching here as well. Um, but if you don't know Seven Song, you probably don't. I'll read you a little bio. So this was his official bio for the Great Lakes Herb Fair. At the age of 12 years old, Seven Song was found in an abandoned mall. No one knows how he got there. In the mall, he was raised by a family of kindly lab-escaped mice who, who took him in as their own. They taught him how to use the plants that grew in the old planters and in the cracks of the overgrown, disused parking lot. He was eventually found by a small cadre of vagabond herbalists who started living in the mall. They took him out to the fields and showed him the medicinal plants and trees. In return, Seven Song taught them what he learned from the mice, which was initially difficult as he only spoke squeak. <laughs> then he demolished them all to put it in an exclusive high rise. He hitchhiked to Greenland where he lived in an ice cave and only ate the foods he could forage in the nearby fjords. Hopefully I get that word correctly. <laughs> Fortunately, two caves over lived a pair of herbalists who continued to teach him the uses of medicinal plants Around 1994, the ice cave was cleaved by climate change, and he slowly drifted to the U.S., where he continued to pursue his interest in plant medicine. All true. What a story. Wow. You had quite the journey to get here. Now you're an esteemed elder at the Great Lakes Herb Fair. Still looking for the people who abandoned <laughs> me at the mall. <laughs> but seriously, what was a, a young Seven Song like in your, say, childhood, minus the mice? Uh, well, there's a lot of ways. I mean, irascible might be one word. A lot of marks on his report card saying needs improvement. And, oh, wow. And, um, but I, so as far as like herbal medicine, the thing that I've always been is a categorizer. Mm. And so, you know, so my first, my first like science that I really liked was astronomy. And I was talked out of astronomy uh, and by somebody, but also it's like astronomy is a very, it's very mathematical. I'm not very mathematical, you know, so astronomy is, it's beautiful looking up in the sky, but actually understanding it. And then I went from there to herpetology. So I'm just like eight or nine years old at this point, wow. maybe 10. And so herpetology is the study of amphibians and reptiles. And so I had flashcards, but I think the main point where I'm really trying to say is, I just like, so what is that constellation? Yeah. What is this reptile? Plants came much later in my life. So, you know, but I was definitely that kid who had lots of questions, which the teachers didn't always like. Um, uh, but I, I've, you know, so I grew up in the suburbs of Long Island, and so not a lot of <laughs> woods at all. And so where I hung out was the barrier between houses and highways, right? So there's a barrier woods. So people, now sometimes there's walls where I grew up, there were, there were woods. And so I'd go in those woods, look and catch salamanders, find some turtles occasionally. Uh, they're probably all dead. I mean, probably been dead a long time from that area. I mean, really, you can't see it, but, uh, you know, it's maybe 40 feet wide. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you consider yourself a categorizer. And I, I've known you for several years now, and you always post on social media various animals or insects that you find. Uh, what kind of drew you to the plants? Why did you decide to become, say, an expert in that? And, 
you do know like your salamanders and whatnot. Do you actually categorize them by family, genus, and species as well? Oh, Are great, you good at that? Or that's a great question. I uh, no, I'm terrible at that. Like, okay. <laughs> like so, so there are some forms of mammals like Covidae yeah. or like the weasel family Muscidae that I can. But the thing about plants is like there's there's 250,000 species. There's not even close to that, like an animal. So most people, you know, like an expert will definitely classify them. But in order to like identify plants, like if you saw an, an ermine and a ferret and a weasel, you could probably tell them apart. But if you saw like three kinds of poison ivy next to each other, it would be more difficult. Mm. So I guess the point is often you have to know like more background or that's what the botanist is saying. Yeah. But I like to think of myself as a naturalist. So yeah. I, I like to think of myself more as interested in wide variety or just things that grow around me or live around me. Yeah. Uh, but, but I started studying plants much more depth in depth when I went to the Platonic Academy of Herbal Studies in Santa Cruz, California in 1981. And a young Christopher Hobbs, a very young seven song, and a young Christopher Hobbs, I took botany classes oh. uh, with him. Actually, we, I, me and a friend uh, would bake goods in exchange for money to go to those classes. And so I had an interest, so I, I gathered plants before that, but Chris definitely was the one to make me start thinking, like, how do I really identify stuff and yeah. starting to key stuff out? Yeah. So when I think of Christopher Hobbs, I think of mushrooms. Do you ever dabble in fungi? I don't think I've ever seen you really talk about them. Dabble is about the right word. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm much more of a botany person than a fungi person. But like lots of herbalists, you know, I can identify like seven or maybe 15 yeah. different edible, medicinal, and poisonous mushrooms. Uh, on this trip for the first time, I gathered an Amanita muscaria, and I forgot the variety, mm -hmm. but I made sure to get that. And I tinctured it, uh, mostly on Jim McDonald's recommendation. Uh, because I want to use it for sciatica, so it's an external use. Okay. Uh, he he and other people have been using amanita mushrooms externally, which means that it doesn't have any of the mind-altering properties. Uh, so I tinctured some. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've never he heard of the external use of yeah. the amanita muscaria. All right. So that was called the Platonic School. Yeah. So I've never heard of that school. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the school existed. Okay. <laughs> Not just in my mind. <laughs> The, um, it wasn't just the Amanita? <laughs> <laughs> no Amanitas for me at that point in my life. Okay. Um, yeah, so it was run by a guy named Paul Lee who just died this year. Um, so you would have to, it's not a lot of herbalists. Like, I don't know anybody. Like Michael Tierra taught alongside of it. Christopher Hobbs taught the botany. Um, it only lasted a few years. Frankly, it, it really didn't have a lot to do with herbal medicine. Yeah. So platonic, because Paul Lee was like Timothy Leary and those other guys was like a Harvard professor dropout oh. who then like kind of went to the dark side or the light side or the plant side. Um, and so he was maybe a Homeric scholar or like a Greek scholar. That's what he taught at Harvard. Sure. So that's why it's called platonic because it has to do with platonic teaching gotcha. rather than platonic relationships. Okay. That's what everybody thinks. Of course. Yeah, I mean, he must have knew that when he named it. Sure. But yeah, if you look it up, there's, you can find little bits about the Platonic Academy of Herbal Studies. Okay. Yeah. So what was, uh, so you went to the plot, 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 plot. Keep that in. <laughs> you went to the Platonic School. Yeah, Platonic what was uh, some of the next uh, mentors you had or uh, schools you went to? Yeah, so this, actually my memory works for this. <laughs> okay. uh, I, think, I, I think as long as people interview me, yeah, sure. I'll remember these back. things, right? <laughs> Which is good, otherwise like, things have like, just disappeared. Yeah. Um, so after the Platonic School, I was, so I was a hitchhiker in those days. Like I, I don't know, I hitchhiked somewhere else and then somewhere else after that. Um, and then in 1982, Two maybe, somewhere around there, I went to the Oregon Country Fair. Mm. And at the Oregon Country Fair, there was a booth for the California School of Verbal Studies. Mm. And I just went there and I was like, wow, this looks beautiful and amazing. And mostly because, <laughs> because the woman who was personing the booth was knitting a tam, like a tam was like these woolen hats. And it had earth tones like normally they're like just bright colors and I was like wow somebody finally like making a hat with earth tones which yeah. obviously I haven't even reached that point yet <laughs> too colorful <laughs> yeah you <I> know <laughs> maybe someday I'll I graduate to brown yeah. <laughs> um and then I looked through their book and then I uh that had like all their field trips and then I noticed that they had an uh they had a work study where you worked half and and then studied and most, you know, so I went to most of the classes, actually not the, not the field trips, yeah. not most of them. 
Um, so after that, I hitchhiked to the Cal so I did that, and then I hitchhiked to the California School of Verbal Studies in '83. Which is how come I know Rosemary? So Rosemary Gladstar oh. is here and just talked about me. The reason I know Rosemary Gladstar is because she was running the school for many years, and when I went there, I met her. Um, so then I helped in the garden and did a work study. Um, and so number two. You ready for number three? I am, but I, I got to okay. know. Okay, so okay, first perfect. of all, was Rosemary at the Oregon Country Fair? When, she was not. Okay, and was Howie Brownstein in the Columbine School at that Oregon Country Fair yet? I didn't meet him there. Okay. I met Howie later. Okay. I think Howie's like one of the first people to start an herb school. I don't think he gets credit for that. Wow. I think the California yeah. school might have been started, but like for one individual doing yeah. a school, Howie's been doing it like almost the longest. And I know um, I actually used to work the Columbine's booth at the Oregon Country oh, Fair. You did? Yeah, yeah. I would roll herbal cigarettes oh, yeah, yeah. all day, every day. So, oh, yeah. uh, and I just think of those two as synonymous. So it's interesting to hear that the California school was there, there as well. Yeah, and they had a booth. Like, I feel like their booth was separate, like, like all the rolly people <laughs> yeah. in one area. Right, right. Uh, but I, I mean, I'm, then my memory starts to get very vague. Sure. But I don't remember, because I, I mean, basically, even then, I start. I mean, I've, I, I had an interest. Yeah. But I don't remember going. Yeah, I don't remember seeing. I, but I don't remember like almost anything. Sure. I do remember they had homemade root beer. Okay. I love. <laughs> Root beer soda, and I like it homemade. Heck yeah. yeah. Right on. Well, all right, let's go to the next step then. So then I had 10 years. Where yeah. Then I did extensive traveling. I mm. I hitchhiked in Europe for about a year. went to India. I did like that whole like hippie trail. And then I came back, and I decided that I wanted to uh, get more in depth with herbal medicine. And so then I, I hitchhiked. To, actually, I did not true. I, me and a friend drove to Michael Moore, who was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I asked him if I could teach botany. Mm -hmm. uh, so I basically, you know, what I've done is I've tried to learn a skill. It's like my first skill was just picking up rocks. And then my Michael Moore, I had been studying botany for enough years uh, where I then taught botany for him. So I did another work exchange because I tried to live without working a lot of time. I don't know a better way of saying that so that I can travel more. And um, so he said, yes. Uh, so he remembered me. So when I, when I met Michael Moore, he's like, you were, so I don't know if anybody here, if you're watching this, knew Michael Moore, but he had a, he had a grumpy or curmudgeonly persona. I mean, I, and he was pretty good with that most of the time. I mean, I spent time with him. So he's like, you're the guy that wore the skirt because I used to wear skirts, you know, kind of Indian skirts or wraps. Yeah. And he's like, and he said that, and then we compared drug notes. And then he said, yeah, you can teach. Wow. Okay. And so then I taught, and then I did that for two years. So he, out of all wow. the herbalists, Michael Moore is by far the most influential for me. Yeah. So I went to his school in 94, 95. I taught botany my first year, <laughs> teaching botany. Fuck, it was like, I, like I, you know, so there's like peers, you know, and so I'm teaching botany and I'd get up like the, like the hour or two, like I just thought like my, my heart would just like bust out because I was nervous. Yeah, sure. Um, but I got better with time. So I really appreciate that. Like Michael Moore gave me like, First, he gave me some, like, he gave me some cred. So Michael Moore is less well-known now, but then he was well-known. So, like, if I said, oh, I studied and taught for Michael Moore, it was an in, it opened some doors for sure. me. But also, I mean, it, it gave me, I mean, I went to a school. I listened to him for two years. Yeah. Uh, so Michael Moore swears a lot, yeah. and I love swearing. And yeah. he's also irreverent, and I am irreverent. And so it was really nice, because often herbal medicine has a nicey-nice aspect sure. to it. Yeah. And it's not really, it's not how I really work. I'm like, I'm a, kind of a New Yorker with like a bad attitude. <laughs> and so it was really nice. And also, and, and more importantly, uh, Michael Moore is a very, is very scientific, his lens is a very scientific lens into herbal medicine as mine has always been, maybe not always, but most of my life. And so, it, you know, so as much as his teaching, knowing that other, these other herbalists had like these qualities of a lot of questioning, potty mouthness and uh, science uh, was it was really it was important uh, you were two yeah. peas in a pod and I could totally see how Chris Cena Dinas was also yes. a big fan of Michael yeah. Moore because she also likes to say the f-bomb and what yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah way more <laughs> yeah yeah um so was Michael Moore personally very uh did he have an expertise in botany mm, no Michael Moore I'm not I never know exactly so you know we go on field yeah. trips and I think, well, Michael Moore is a great memory. And so he would point out yeah. plants and he would sometimes know what they were by their botanical characteristics. Yeah. But I'm not actually sure he keyed out plants. I think maybe he did it once and then he would memorize. Like someone like myself will keep plants out, the same plants over yeah. and over again. 
So, but he, he did know his plants. Like when he said like this plant is uh, Asclepius Esperula, mm -hmm. it was pretty much always right because I would key it out afterwards because I'm <laughs> gathering, I want to be sure. But from anybody, unless, sure. unless they were a, really a trained botanist. No, he was good at, no, so I would say yes. I don't know if he was, called himself a botanist. Well, actually, yeah. Michael Moore put down botanists all the time mm. and I was the school botanist. Yeah. So, <laughs> Put so, <you> down. <laughs> so he would he would do he would say stuff because botanists change the names of plants on yeah. a regular. And if he was alive now, it would be so much because DNA has changed it even more. Yeah. But yeah, he always put down botanists, and so he would look at me. You know, isn't chrysanthemum leucanthemum no longer chrysanthemum? Now it's leucanthemum vulgar. <sighs> what a shame! Oh, there's, that's a terrible. <laughs> so out of most of them, chrysanthemum leucanthemum. Chris means gold. Anthema means flower. Luke means white. Uh, anthema means flower, so chrysanthemum, leucanthemum means gold flower, white flower, wow. which is true because they're yellow and white. Yeah. Uh, but now they changed it. Leucanthemum now means white flower, and vulgar means common. Okay. Yeah. Um, we could keep going, but I am kind of yeah, curious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how important do you think it is for herbalists to know botany, or if at all? So, I would, so first we have to use the different terms. So sure. botany is the study of plants. Mm -hmm. And so I actually just know a very small segment of botany. Like oh. if I was a real bot, like I don't understand plant physiology that well, or I don't understand plant diseases that well, or, mm. you know, how plants grow in specific ways or, you know, so botany is, a, is a, an extremely large, so anybody who's a botanist will have specialty in botany. Gotcha. My specialty would be taxonomy, which is the naming of plants. So I know, I know plants because I can identify them because I know their taxonomy and botanical characteristics. Good so, differentiation. Yeah. 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 So I, do, I mean, I do say I'm a botanist because that's a shorthand yeah. for lots of different kinds of botany. Um, but um, so, I, so me and Howie, Bronstein are the two herbalists that force our students to learn how to identify plants in a technical manner. Yeah. Um, and almost all the students dislike it. It's a, <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's very, it's vigorous. It's very deductive. Yeah, certain kinds of brains work for better. I, I have a deductive brain, so it works good for me. Like if it's this or this, and it's not this, if it's this and this, and it's this, um, but most of the students, like Greg, who is here, actually took, took botany in my school and then went with it. Yeah. But I would say most of them just resell their Gleason and Cronquist, which is the technical book we use. Mm. But is it important? I would say if you're gathering plants and you're naming them. So if you have like a cultural milieu, if you've been grown up in a tradition, if you live in an area, like so you grew up around Portland, Oregon, and then somebody who knows the plants well taught you all those plants and you stay there, you don't really need to know. Like you have learned the plants from an expert, whether they're science trained or traditional trained. Yeah. But if then you travel, let's say you go to Wisconsin and then you start picking plants, um, then it's important to know the differences from them. And one thing I think that gets overlooked is that many, there are rare plants, like here there will not be. This is a very used thing. There's a lot of non-natives and even the native plants are the common native plants. But in many areas, and herbalists often wildcraft in, in places that have been less disturbed, there are just rare plants that look like not rare plants. Yeah. So the differentiation is gonna be technical. And so like, it might have to do with a, like a, how the bract is based on it. So I would say, if you're going wildcrafting outside of your scope of knowledge, uh, then actually knowing how to identify plants is important for the plant's sake. And then, of course, you're putting it in people. If you're putting it in people's bodies, which is kind of what herbalists do, yeah. uh, then is that's also important. I can and, see that. Yeah, there's a lot of safe plants, but you know, you're talking to somebody who spent this. So, like, my nemesis is the botany app. Right, uh -huh. because that's going to displace me eventually. Like right now, they're not great. So I have a few more years before those botany apps yeah. where you take a picture and it shows that they're going to get really excellent because they're AI, yeah. right? Uh, so. Just a quick break from the show to thank our presenting sponsor, Oshala Farm. Oshala Farm is a beautiful and vibrant certified organic herb farm based in Southern Oregon, where they grow and sell over 80 different plant species. The founders, Elise and Jeff Higley, have been longtime friends, so I highly trust their growing methods and ethics. You'll love the potency and vibrancy of all the herbs they have to offer. To learn more and purchase their herbs and other organic goods, head to oshalafarm.com. So thanks once again to Oshala Farm for sponsoring the Herbalist Hour. Now back to the show. Enjoy.
Yes. Uh, I have to ask yeah. to follow up. I mean, I know we're kind of kidding about the AI, AI stuff, but maybe not as well. Are you actually worried, like, say, an herbalist career path might be in danger because of AI and everything? Or <laughs> I, I think we're so low <laughs> on the hierarchical, like, pay scale of anybody <laughs> that nobody's going to AI us anytime soon because it's not worth it. Like, it's just cheaper to pay herbalists to do their job. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I think that AI is not going to do it. But actually... Yeah. Probably not for a long time. For the same reason, so it would actually probably be easier for a medical person to have an AI diagnosis mm. because they tend to ask standardized questions. Right. Herbalists don't tend to ask standardized questions. Um, but in, in the future, some of it will be taken over. I mean, it only makes sense that, you know, you put in information, information over the course of years, you know, uh, you know it's going to just improve. Yeah. And so, but it will not be my generation. Yeah. Well, you were bringing up Portland to Wisconsin, yeah. and uh, you should have said Eugene. I well, know. no, you're absolutely right, though. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I moved from Eugene, Oregon, to Wisconsin, and I had the fortune of taking the Columbine School of Botanical Studies, where uh, I did want to say, at first, learning the botany did it was, it wasn't, it didn't come natural to me. Right. I will say I'm super grateful that I did it because eventually I did kind of pick it up, and now you know you see the wall of green, and now I could actually differentiate between plants, see the botanical characteristics, and now that I live in Wisconsin, although I don't know a lot of the plants, I do see certain characteristics, and I'm like, oh, at least I could say it's in that plant family. So I'm super grateful to Howie and Stephen and the Columbine School for that. Uh, it's amazing. Like yeah. I so uh, so I I travel fairly frequently. And if you stay actually in the northern hemisphere of the world, yeah. there's, the families are pretty consistent. And if the plant's in flower, you're like, oh, that's a Rosaceae, that's yeah. a Berberidaceae. And so it really allows identification. So that means if I go to a new place, I need a flora. A flora is a book that has all sure. the plants of an area. Uh, but I don't have to start from the beginning because often right. I look at a flower, I'm like, oh, that's going to be, you know, that, well, that's a, well, actually the Frymaceae is a very difficult to tell. Mm -hmm. There's a Phryma over here. Yeah. Well, would you be open to talking about one of the plants? Maybe we could, uh, you could teach us a little bit about poison ivy since we were talking about before the, <laughs> before the interview? Or? Well, this is Eliagnus umbellata. Okay. And this, so this is a very weedy shrub. Yeah. And it's right up over here. I'm going to grab some fruits and bring them back. Uh, one thing that's pretty interesting is the plant is lepidote, which means it has scales like lepidoptery is the study of butterflies because butterfly wings have scales and moth wings have scales. And this is like green on one side. And then it's lepidote or silvery scaly in the bottom, which is just pretty. But it's crazily invasive and common. But it has really, the fruits are also lepidote. This is going to be harder to see. They have silver sparkles on them. It's basically scales. But if you like sour with a little bit of sweet, these are delicious. Have you tried them? I haven't. Yeah, try them. I saw some kid eating these yesterday, though. Yeah. So... This is a non-native plant. I mean, I'm a non-native person. My, you know, my family's been here three generations. That is really good. They're delicious. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're not far from me in New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole... Uh, <laughs> I'm getting the common name. Ellie Agnes. <laughs> um, uh, autumn olive. It's called autumn ah, olive. I've heard of that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a whole, like, they make autumn olive. It's like the garlic thing in Gilroy, California. They make autumn olive ice cream. Mm. And I don't know what they do. <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I would just say, like... You know, the, you know, so that's more of a foraging thing. I've never used this for medicine. Yeah. I've never used, most of the plants right in here are what's called Virginia creeper. Mm. And I've never seen that used for medicine. Actually, when I asked Michael Moore uh, if it's used for medicine, he rumphed me. <laughs> <laughs> so, rumph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, there's not too many plants I use. This is garlic mustard, another very invasive weed, but mm -hmm. it just sticks right now. <laughs> there's some goldenrod, which I do use for medicine. There's some small yellow flowers you probably can't see. So when you're doing your plant walk later on, it's not going to be here. It's not going to be right <laughs> here. No, we're going to start at bone set and mm. then maybe go to skull cap and then maybe mull like some of the plants that people will know. Yeah. But then we'll do a couple of obscure and then if we find, if people, I mean, my guess, a lot of people know the autumn olive. Uh, but we'll probably eat some of those. This is a tulip, a uh, tree mm. tulip, poplar. So it's in the magnolia family. Uh, it's also not used that often for medicine. Right on. Yeah. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. Sure. You've been in this uh, herbal world for a long time. Let's hit, uh, hit you with the hard hitting questions here. What <laughs> do you appreciate about what do you appreciate about the herbal community, and what would you like to see some improvement on? So. So I think about this pretty regularly. You know, I mean, I've run an herb school yeah. 
So I've run it in herb school since 19 something, right? 1992. And so I think like, maybe that, maybe that's, that's maybe just a plug for my school. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Northeast School of Botanical Medicine. Sevensong.com. Yes. That's exactly, a number seven. Exactly. I'm, I'm getting closer to retiring, so not too many more years. Um, so really, but it's less about that. So number one, like, so a common question is, why herbal medicine? And the answer is, I'm not really sure. Like, why do we do anything is a question. Like, unless, like, your parents were a baker and you were a baker, right. like, then it's like, why did you do it? But I think the main reason is actually the community. So, I, like, I need supportive community. Like, I never would have said this in, in, in my early 20s or whatever until, you know, until some years ago when I thought about, like, what do I really like about it? And I think the herbal community tends to be on the kind side, yeah. but the quirky side, yeah. um, often thoughtful. And so when I go to something like this, like I get overwhelmed with a lot of people around me, sure. and but it's still like good people to feel overwhelmed around. Like right. I could probably just say that because I've been in other situations where it just feels tight and talking to people feels very struggling. Yeah. And I would say the herbal community, I mean, you would know this well because yeah. you, know, you interview people and just meet a lot of people. Yeah. But I think the thing that I like most about the herbal community um, is the community. And That's I've just been... You know, it's just been a lot of years. And so, you know, I mean, coming from like a street urchin -y by meaning a brat background and, you know, having this group of people that help support me intellectually and, but also not, not try to get confined into like, you know, uh, into a square person in a square, a square hole. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, whatever a square hole is called. <laughs> so... Uh, so that's, that's, I think, what I appreciate yeah. the most. And here's the crazy shit. So I'm a high school dropout. Like, I dropped, I left high school at 15. I had to go to a special yeah. school because I dropped out too early. I am terrible at school. Like, I don't test well. I'm not so good with authority figures. And so I left school real early. And I didn't do anything good. Like, sometimes I'll meet, like, there's somebody here I met who dropped out of high school and then, like, did great stuff. I didn't. I just yeah. dropped out and didn't do anything particularly good at all. <laughs> And so I think the surprise to many people is that I started, I became a teacher who runs their own school. But that actually makes sense because I like learning. I just don't do good in a confined environment. Yeah. So, and in the United States in particular, uh, the herb schools really vary a lot, like as far as like who your teacher is, because, because free freedom of speech. So there, uh, I am not moving into a patriotic moment here, but freedom of speech is something that is allowed to be done here. You can say almost everything that's not inciting riots. Yeah. And even there, if you watch the news, <laughs> that gets tricky. Um, and so that means that pretty much anybody can, as long as you pay your taxes, you can run any kind of school you want. And so herbalists have done that. They've, there's all different kinds of schools that have come and gone over the years. And often it's just somebody says, I like this and I want to teach this. Yeah. So I, I like that kind of diversity. Ready for the second part? Sure am. So then the, the second part, this, this is going to sound elitist and it's tricky. And it really, it's, it's e kind of easy to say, but hard to say. I'll just say it. So my worry, and it has to do with what I just said, is that a lot of people who practice herbal medicine don't understand how important modern medicine is to keep mm. people alive. So I work in a, so this is a kind of a clinical elitism that I would say that I harbor. Um, I work with a lot of very sick people and herbal medicine is important to them, but their drugs are more important to them. Then maybe surgery or radiation might be more important to them. So this is not trying to give the slip to our horrible medical system that charges a lot and, and depersonalizes people. Like our system, the United States has a horrible medical system. I mean. At, as far as like advanced medicine, it's here. Yeah. But as far as like feeling like you're a real human being and getting proper care, that can be very difficult. And proper affordable care can be nearly impossible. But that's not what I'm talking about. So, uh, you know, so at a certain level, if somebody has like a mild case of COVID, yeah. you can definitely give herb because they're going to get better. Yeah. But as soon as they have some more debilitating, like a form of rheumatoid arthritis that's crippling them and they're, you know, they're, now their fingers are it's hard for them to use, you know, some of the new biologic drugs are going to be much more effective and then you can give herbs for everything else or whatever else is necessary. So, my concern 
And the thing that I don't like is sometimes I feel like we don't take people's health seriously enough and understand that there are multiple ways. And it's not just herbs, it's not just drugs, right? There's massage therapy, there's mental health counseling, and there's many ways. And that's another place where the system fails us, right? Because like I work in a free clinic that has multiple modalities, and that's often what's necessary, right? There's the person's mind that maybe talking to somebody is helpful. The person's body, maybe some physical change, whether it's acupuncture or massage or chiropractic. Um, and then there's internal medicine. But again, uh, I think I think the one thing that it's, I'm going to make, I'm going to make a comparison. Sure. So the one thing everybody should teach if they teach about plants is the first thing you teach is all the plants that will kill you. Right, because there's hardly any. Right. There's like unless you, like you, a tree falls on you. Most plants around here are not deadly poisonous. They might make you sick. They might make you vomit. They might make, give you diarrhea. But you will recover. But there are plants that you will not recover from. So really, before you pick anything, like you have to know that certain mushrooms will kill you, and then certain plants will kill you. And the roots are the worst part if they are. Uh, well, the same thing is true in healthcare. So I think that for some people, like you have to know, like this person's not. This person's shakiness and not being able to hold a physical object and dropping it could be some kind of nervous system disorder that should be sought medical care, if possible, yeah. uh, should be sought. And so I think that we that's one problem. And then the other thing is we don't have a collection of data of clinical herbalism. So all the stuff that I'm saying about what I don't care for is actually about practicing clinical herbalism, meaning working with people that you don't really know, right? Because yeah. working with family, they can be very forgiving for stuff. Uh, working with people are, who you don't know are less forgiving yeah. for things uh, because they don't know you. And so I don't really know what to do about that, but I think uh, there's some classes here actually focused on clinical, it's really just critical thinking. Yeah. Because the goal of seeing a sick person, an unhealthy person, and we all have unhealth. I mean, like, unless you're super young, everybody, like, this is like 10 trillion cells trying to get along. Right. That's all of our bodies. Yeah. And so some cells are just not going to function. It might be your heart, it might be your liver, it might be your kidneys, it might be your skin, it might be your brain, whatever it is. And over the course of time, you're going to, you know, the body breaks down. Yeah. And so I think understanding like some of the cardinal signs of like this needs to be seen medically and then how and how to network the person into it because sometimes there's no option like you have to figure out again I work in a clinic so we can at least figure out how to get somebody to get some labs at a reasonable price we don't have labs at the clinic I think I was going to say something else but I lost my train of thought that's fair maybe it'll come back okay. but um so you work closely with MDs at the free clinic I do yeah um have you noticed over the course of time of working with them, especially if you've worked with the same doctors, have they come to respect what you do as an herbalist? <laughs> uh, they've come to respect the, my snarkiness. <laughs> I'm not sure they respect that. Um, I would say, all right, so again, this is kind of elitist talk. So sure. a lot of herbalists are taught in a very traditional manner. I'm not. I'm taught in a science manner of herbal medicine. But what that means is I speak the same language as doctors. Totally. And so I've been, you know, I'm one of the founders of a free clinic. It's not my clinic, but I'm, I am one of the people who helped start it 16 yeah. years ago. It's, it's many people part of the clinic. Yeah. Um, so when the, I talk to the doctors, mm -hmm. they, I speak the language they speak. Right. And I understand the language they tell me. And it makes them feel way more, it makes them feel like I'm not too far out. Right. So I'm not sure, like, they really like herbal medicine. I mean, what they do is they'll send me people if they want drugs that they think the drugs are bad for them. Let's say the person has taken antibiotics for something, they think the antibiotic they shouldn't, they might send them to me even though yeah. I can't because I can't prescribe antibiotics. Yeah. I'm not a medical doctor. Um, so I would say, so the doctors have come and go. Almost all the doctors that have worked in the free clinic are retired doctors. So they are with us for a few years before they retire even more. Oh. Um, but I would say I have good relationships with them. But I, I would think that if I was a more spiritual herbalist, yeah. And if maybe if they were more spiritual, I don't know the doctor's spiritualities, yeah. uh, but no, in general, I, I'm pretty well received in the medical community. Also, I'm cautious, right? Right, which they want to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I would like to get to some guest questions. Okay. All right, here we well, go. here's a Krista Sinadinas question. Thanks for submitting these. Um, Krista asks, what herb has he used for decades in practice that has been significantly less effective than it's acclaimed to be? or vice versa, what's been more effective than he's anticipated? Oh. Um, 
On the more effective side, Chaparral, Larea tridentata, hmm. um, not internally, but externally. So, some, I, so a lot of my work is first aid work, and we see a lot of infections. And I would say over the course of time, I, I rely more and more on Chaparral for many kinds of pussy infections. Okay. Um, so maybe that's one that's grown more. I probably, in some ways though, I've, I learned internal uses and I don't use it internally anymore because of potential damage. But there's a lot of herbs that, um, I would, how about, we'll go with cleavers. Oh. So cleavers or gallium aparine um, is supposed to help clear the lymph. I'm not sure the herb doesn't work, but the whole, so it, this is a tricky question. So like clearing your lymph is a weird concept because the lymph glands swell from infection generally. And so if you clear the lymph, you're just pushing infection. Like you're not helping the body. It's like, I, I don't know, it's like get, trying to clear the thing that's trying to do a positive thing. So I would think like cleavers, while well, I'm starting to use it again, for a long time I just like didn't use it because I didn't really understand like what, what's the purpose yeah. of trying to help swollen lymph glands go down unless the lymph glands are infected. And then that might be helpful, but then you're not trying to clear them, you're trying to kill infection. So I'll go with cleavers on trying to figure out what that really does and chaparral is something. But really, all right, so but the plant that I've used more and more and more is plants that contain high amounts of berberine. Mm. So I use a lot of Japanese barberry. I used to use Oregon grapefruit, yeah. but that doesn't grow near me and it's a native plant, so just let it be, even though it's very common. But Japanese barberry is extremely weedy in parts of New York. I mean, really? Oh yeah, if you go to nice. Richard Mandelbaum, who runs the Arborvitae School, like his mm. yard is just massive mm. Japanese barberry. And so, so that's what I've been using and using it more and using it mostly for internal and external infections, uh, both bacterial and viral. So actually, so even more than chaparral, that's the plant that kind of holds a center stage for me and has for years. Is the Japanese barberry a Mahonia? It's a Berberus. Oh, Berberus. And okay. most Mahonias are now put in the genus Berberus, oh depending on which book you use. Sorry. No, it, it, well, because when I learned it, how he taught it as Berberus nervosa or yeah, Berberus yeah. aquifolium. That'd be and, right. And, um, I want to say during that time it switched to Mahomet, but he's like, "Fuck it, I want to keep Berberus." So yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, actually, Berberus is the more is the more current one. Okay. But this right. is the Michael Moore thing. This is yeah. why Michael Moore didn't All like right. Bonnie's. Is like they're just always screwing with us, <laughs> and it's it maybe true. But I, yeah. I'm not like that's like that's another level. Like I don't name plants. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's go to the next one. What treatment strategies and herbs does he most commonly use and find effective for treating insulin resistance? So there's two herbs that I use regularly for type two diabetes with insulin resistance. I mean, like, so this could be interpreted as like meta, metabolic X syndrome or syndrome X. Um, so I'm not going with that. I'm just saying for people who have type two diabetes and usually not insulin dependent yet, mm -hmm. um, first they need medicines if they have high numbers. Yeah. So I want to put, I, like, there's no way I want to say like, I mean, in particular, a lot of people are alive because of diabetes medicines. I mean, why more diabetes is on the rise is a whole other question. Food, environment, stress. But there are two plants that I mix together that will often bring the numbers down. So if you know your A1Cs, let's say they had like an A1C of 12, they take the metformin and maybe what other medicines, and now it's like 9.2. And then sometimes if you give them herbs, you can get it down to like eight. And the two herbs are Japanese barberry, because berberine brings it down, or any berberine containing herb, and cinnamon. And often in vegetable glycerin, because vegetable glycerin does not raise blood sugar. Oh, I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, uh, because it's more related to alcohol than sugar. Oh. And um, I'm not really sure. I mean, my chemistry is weak in this. Sure. Uh, but no, the, it's very, the science is clear. Also, I give, them, I give them these things, and then we measure later, you know. So, so that's actually my favorite treatment. But I would, at this point, I think there's like 50 or 60 common plants that help insulin resistance. Mm. And these are just the two that I've stayed with because I gather them and cinnamon is extremely easy to purchase. So yeah. Ubiquitous, I mean, yeah. it tastes good. Yeah, so. it tastes good. Yeah. Well, you, initially, if you have to take it a long time, <laughs> then the flavor becomes scrunchy. For sure. Yeah. So last one from Krista. Thanks again, Krista, for submitting all these amazing questions. Oh, um, so how does Yohembi compare to the effectness, effectiveness of Viagra? <laughs> Why are you staring at me so intently? <laughs> As I slowly <laughs> turn. It's like it's some personal thing going on here. <laughs> um, so, 
that's pretty straightforward. Viagra actually works, and Yohembe is a central nervous system stimulant. So out of all the people I've known that have tried Yohembe, very few of them have had positive erectile function. I've tried Yohembe two or three times, um, but I thought it was like from the right companies. And, and for me, it's like crazy amounts of speed. It is so uncomfortable. I mean, my penis goes inside <laughs> when I take that stuff, <laughs> right? It's just like hides from the rest of my spinal nerves. I mean, it is, flight. Yeah, exactly, and totally flight. Yeah. No, no, no flight going on at all. Yeah, no, and so, so I have met one or two people that have said, if they take Yohimbi, blood rushes to their penis and they have an erection, mm -hmm. but most people find, because it is a central nervous system stimulant, yeah. uh, find it very aggravating. Where Viagra, I, so I haven't tried Viagra, yeah. um, but I am pro-Viagra and, and pro, there's three main drugs for erectile dysfunction, all working on the same principle. Um, but Viagra for many people is helpful. I was frankly real, I mean, I'm the, the marketing of it and all that and the money I'm not so into, but actually, so for some, so I, a lot of my practice has been inclusive male healthcare for a lot of my life. That's, I mean, I focus on having, having a male body, working with people with various kinds of male bodies. Uh, and what common problem has actually been erectile dysfunction and Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, uh, really for some people work and sometimes they don't need to keep taking them. So actually I'm very pro uh, those medicines. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks for the thoughtful questions, Krista. Um, we'll do we'll do a couple rapid fire questions from Betsy Miller and Jim McDonald. Oh no! So here we go. It's like a bad team. This yeah, like they getting double teamed by them. Is they not, they not teamed up good. on these. Yeah. Can you really call yourself an herbalist if you don't like dark chocolate? Yes. Okay. So the reason they're saying that is this Hershey wrapper in my pocket. <laughs> So I, before anybody Is makes that milk chocolate, chocolate yes. So, so I actually I don't really love Hershey's uh, chocolate, but Betsy went to town, and I actually like milk chocolate better than dark chocolate, which is where this question is coming from. But not really Hershey's. But I'm glad I had the wrapper just for this. Yeah. yeah. So yes. Awesome. Good I think know. dark chocolate lovers are elitists. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think. You hear that? All right. If oil has precipitated sediment at the bottom of the bottle, it's not funny. Then when, <laughs> then what is the best way to warm it up to get it back into solution? Oh, that might be a serious one. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just usually strain it. Okay. Yeah, this is a. G oh. Uh, oh. Right. Uh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so Thanks for let's remembering. let's just say. <laughs> that in practice, recently with Jim's kava oil, let's pretend I put it under my armpit to warm it up and just go from there. <laughs> um, I'm not going to ask that because we're going to save that for the end. It was about Alaska. Um, how much cake is unreasonable to carry in your pocket? There is no unreasonable amount. So notice <laughs> this pocket and this pocket are cake pockets. <laughs> so I, I, you can put some in here though they tend to get crushed. These are terrible. These pockets are terrible for cake. So uh, I tend to have a habit of when I have a chance and there's a lot of food around to stash some on me Totes. and bring some to my, uh, you would think that I just grew up without uh, access to food, uh, but that would be not true. So, but, but I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a food hoarder, especially certain kinds of sweets. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, you heard it here first. Thanks, Betsy Miller and Jim McDonald, for the guest questions. Uh -huh. um, well, I do want to hear about your Alaska trip, but before we get into that, kind of, I have a question for you. Uh, can you give advice to the budding herbalist on how to uh, pursue a career in herbalism? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I run a school. And so here's the truth it's really hard to make a livelihood in herbalism. So, Mason has done it by going on the video end and also having a previous job with the company. Um, I've done it by teaching, uh, but it's, there's very few herbalists. Katie Crabb in uh, Southern Ohio actually makes her livelihood as a clinical herbalist. That's where she makes most of her money. Uh, but actually that's really uncommon. I, I called her up just to see if that was true, and it is true. Mm. Um, and so I think the thing that you really have to, so I don't mean, I mean this, it's just like, you got to keep your day job initially because herbal medicine is not widely paid. People don't pay a lot for it. And here's another reality. 
people like me make this worse. And the reason for this, so this is kind of snarky and kind of true. Like, so I am an herbalist at a free clinic. All the herbs at the free clinic are free. And if, you, if you're there in person, and all the consultations are free no matter where you live, because we could do those online. So in a sense, I devalue herbal medicine, right? Mm -hmm. Because here I am like a fairly well-known herbalist and I work for free. I mean, I have my own reasons for that. I want to see herbal medicine be spread and I want it to be affordable and available to as many people as possible. Yeah. But the problem with that is other people want to make their livelihood as a clinical herbalist. And so by people like myself doing it this way, it makes it look like, oh, you know, everybody should do it for free, but that's not true. I mean, my students, Study, you go to my school for a year and then study other places for a year and practice. And it's hard for them to make livelihoods. Really, teaching is the main way. And products are way down the line. It's very hard to make. You know, it's easy to make products and sell a few, but to actually make an income. Yeah. I only have one student, Abby, with Zizia Botanicals in L.A., uh, but she's been doing it for 15 years and has really been pushing it the whole time and has finally figured out, you know, a way. But it's really, so, I mean, I'm, partly saying like they're the students and I'm proud of them doing this, but it's pretty difficult. So I think the first thing is like, you, if, you, if money is a concern, and money is a concern, um, is where do you think, like start to think of like, where do you think you fit into it? There's not that many, I actually have a handout on my website, which is sevenzong.com. Uh, that's 69 ways to be an herbalist, but really very few of them are realistic. Yeah. You know, like I have, write an herbal novel. I mean, I have all kinds of stuff right. that I just spent way too much time thinking about. Um, but herbal medicine is a valuable, this is, this is the chamber of commerce moment. Herbal medicine is valuable and it can be affordable if you gather the medicines. You can't expect your patients to gather medicines, right? So I work in a free clinic. The idea of my patients gathering medicine is thoughtless, right? They're, they're sick. They often have two or three jobs. They might have families. I mean, there's no way they're going to learn how to gather the correct plant and make the medicines. But if you make them and you have the time to make them, because it's not free, right? It's only free if you have amazing amounts, large amounts of time to do this. Um, all right. So I've known for this like kind of realistic, but downplaying the avenues of herbal medicine. But I mean, I've been running a school a long time. And so I have, I mean, I have five students teaching That's here, cool. but different, they make money and often they have other jobs to help them. And then sometimes they make the leap and they move into something like teaching or being a clinical herbalist. But what I would say is learn your shit. Yeah. Like, learn how to be a good herbalist. Like, you know, go through multiple sources. Uh, I, of course, I would think, make sure you understand your warning signs and understand, like, the real health needs of people from a medical viewpoint as much as you can. Um, and, you know, be very clear with transparency about your knowledge and skills. But people love it. Like, it is so, it is so wonderful to have this skill where somebody's like, you know, I've had this rash for a long time and for years, and whenever I try these creams, it just gets worse. And I might not be the one to help, but I'm definitely one of the people that might, that has an opportunity to say, okay, here's some herbs uh, and try this. And so, and it, one thing that's happened since 1981 is herbal medicine, at least in this culture, right? Because yeah. in many cultures, herbal medicine has never swayed or moved away. Right. But in this kind of more, uh, I don't know, suburban, urban culture, um, it's become more and more popular and people are really want to know about herbal medicine. Yeah. And it is a thrill to be a person, to be able to help people, uh, and, or at least, all right, so just take another, I, I know we're getting close no, here, sure. but one thing that I do as an herbalist, I think one of, in fact, I'd say like one of the things that I do most as an herbalist is be a bridge between, uh, is to be a bridge for people to understand what their medical diagnoses are, what the possibilities are. I have a pretty good understanding, I mean, I teach physiology and anatomy, and I have a pretty good understanding of many medications and learn them when I need to learn them. And I have a good understanding of a lot of the pathophysiology, like what goes on in our body for a lot of diseases. And so if somebody has diabetes, for instance, often what they don't understand is why is sugar in our blood a problem? And when you describe that, it helps people understand it and make, I think, better choices with understanding it or make whatever choices they want, but knowing that sugar basically causes inflammation in the bloodstream for reasons we don't know. Mm. And so for me, my avenue has been to be the bridge between the herbal world and conventional medicine and conventional diagnosis. But I think 
the thing is like everybody has separate talents. Like I am, I'm good with medical sciences. That's my strong suit. There are other approaches like there's acu, there's, you know, like TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, but there's actually many approaches and there's many cultural approaches. But the thing is like, you have to learn. It's not like going and hang around with somebody for a day or two and learning some Latina, Latino herbal practices. Like if you want to know that, that's going to take years because it's, you know, it's an in-depth cultural tradition. Uh, so I would say, I would say learn it and study it, but understand that for most people, uh, it's actually not that easy to make a livelihood, at least initially. And for many people, it stays on the side. Yeah. So sorry to be pessimistic, not sorry to be realistic. No, I think there's a lot of value there, and I think some people might even rewind it and re-listen to that, and we'll be sure to include the 69 tips to be an herbalist <laughs> okay. uh, in the uh, the podcast show notes along with the YouTube description, so appreciate that, uh, sure. those words of advice. Um, I know you're kind of on the last leg of, of an epic trip you just <laughs> took, so can you tell us about um, this journey you took and maybe some stories or lessons that you took along the way? So I'm so glad to get to do this because this is like the only time in my life I'm going to be able to do this. So in mid-July, I left to drive to Alaska. So I turned 65 this year. So I'm getting old. I'm now part of Rosemary's <laughs> Herbal Elders presentation. <laughs> I, I, I made some jump this year to 65. Yeah. And it's also now I have Medicare. So like most Americans, uh, insurance has always been problematic. And now finally I've reached an age where at least I get some of some stuff covered. It makes a difference for me. I mean, it's, there's not a side effect. Like having reasonable insurance for the first time it means I feel more comfortable traveling in yeah. other situations. So uh, some months ago, I was thinking, all right, I'm going to take this year off, not travel, take kind of my 65th birthday. And then I thought, what can I not do any other time? And I, the answer was go to Alaska. And then I thought, could I drive? And though, so I did it. I had, my car is not particularly new. It's about eight years old, not particularly old. Um, and uh, I started thinking, started buying stuff, some stuff I never needed, uh, and decided <laughs> that I wanted to drive to Alaska. In order to force myself to drive to Alaska, because I knew that I would start getting cold feet, you know, in July, because I I love being home. So this is like I'm not teaching. I could be home in my garden in my home um, at this time of the year. So what I did is I bought a ferry ticket from <laughs> Bellingham, uh, Bellingham, 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 uh, Washington to Haines, Alaska, and so that ticket, wow. that ferry ticket, cost. $1,650. So I am definitely not going to let that money go to waste. So I kind of, and I had to buy it. It had to be a date. So it was July 21st. So I kind of bought a ticket to force myself. So, because it started happening like July 10th. I'm like, yeah, uh, July 12th. Cause I, so I finally on July 14th, I left. I also wanted to see the Black Hills of South Dakota, which I've always wanted to see. I only spent two days there, but got in a great walk with uh, Linda Black Elk, because mm. she's also a botanist. And then I made it to the ferry, of course, with plenty of time. I waited in line for hours before I needed to. Um, actually, so here's the story. So while I was waiting in line in Bellingham, Washington for the ferry, uh, this person, this female, pulls up in a, motor car, in a motorcycle with a sidecar. And I've always wanted to ride in the side. I did it once. I was hitchhiking in Crete, Greece in the 80s and got a ride in the sidecar. And I've always wanted to do it again. So on the ferry, I did, uh, so I talked to her for just a few minutes. She got a lot of attention for this person, for this female being on a motorcycle with a side, like lots of attention. So I was like, oh, I don't need to be there. Anyway, eventually I saw her on the ferry. We kind of got friendly, you know, just started talking. She was going to Anchorage, which eventually I was going to. So when I got to Anchorage, I contacted her through Instagram and asked her, will you give me a ride in your sidecar? And she said, yes. Wow. So I spent 45 minutes going around Anchorage, kind of scary <laughs> in, uh, without a helmet, going around Anchorage in a sidecar with somebody learning how to. So Denali, if you're watching this, thank you. That was amazing. Uh, her name is Denali. Yeah, so I got the ferry. I, if you ever get a chance, so it's expensive. If you don't have a car, it's way less expensive. And I also set up a tent on the ferry, but to ride up the inner passage, uh, to Alaska from uh, Washington is so stunningly beautiful. Mm. And at times it's so thick and like the tent will blow because it gets very windy. Um, and so one of the things I never thought, so I started my herb school in 1992. And one of the things I really never thought about was I'll start an herb school. So when I'm getting close to retiring, I'll have students in all these places who will let me stay at their homes. And that's exactly what happened. So I started, you know, I visited a number of students I taught in three different places in Alaska. Um, 
But so I'm on my way. So the thing is, this is the thing I won't be able to say again. I am on my way home. So I left Alaska August 25th. Um, it's now September 9th. And I, I, this was always a plan to come to the Great Lakes Herb Fair. It was kind of to push me to get back home. Sure. Um, and now I'm, you know, so on tomorrow evening, on Sunday, I will drive home. It's about eight hours. One of the things that's changed dramatically is my time, is my time schedule or something. Like in the past, I thought that eight hours seems like a long drive after this trip. So now, so I'm, if I write a blog, I'm probably going to call it Mr. Carbon Footprint because <laughs> I've now driven 9,850 miles. So it would be 10 when I get home, uh, 10,000 miles. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's just seeing a different environment. Uh, my favorite part as far as animals, so I wanted to see, I saw lots of plants, which is amazing, but also like the, the top northeast of British Columbia, there was a stretch of like 300 miles or less where I saw like five black bear on the side of the road, one with mom and cubs. I saw a number of quite a few caribou, bison, um, uh, just a few of the native sheep, which look like goats. That was, and then there was there's this incredible Layard is what it's called, Layard Hot Springs uh, in BC. It's like $5 to get in. The hot springs are just like natural, what well, kind of natural hot springs, you know, they kind of built it up a little bit, beautiful. I uh, Also just seeing a lot of my friends making, like reacquainting myself. That's been one of the amazing things about running an herb school. Is that we started off with this question of what do I like? And I have like, a lot of my close friends are former students and teachers. Like I have, I would say like you, Mason, yeah. and now Amanda, and my community continues to grow uh, through being in herbal medicine. But so Alaska, I kind of reacquainted myself with some of the students I haven't seen in many, many years. I got to see that it seems like everybody has seven junked cars in every in everybody's house in Alaska, like in case they ever need whatever, some carburetor or some tiny piece from each one. Because things break down. Yeah. Yeah. When, when things get down to minus 30, things break down. Um, I saw your eagle shot too. Oh, that was amazing. Yeah. yeah that was at my friend's house. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Bald headed eagles. Yeah. So it was grazing animals. The diversity of plants is, is kind of low, but still is wonderful. Like aconite, so a form of monkshood, aconitum delphinium folia, it's just like, there's just monkshood all over the place. Um, so I'm pretty excited. You know, I'm going home. So I, the one thing I've definitely have done on this trip is put off everything, right? Totally. So I'd like everybody who's applying to my school in 2024, next year, I'm like, just send me a reminder in September. So when I get home, that part I'm not looking forward to. <laughs> but I do look forward to like getting nude and sitting in my house, <laughs> not sleeping in my, not sleeping in my van. I love sleeping in the van, but it'll be nice to have a bed and just stretch out. Oh, you'll feel like you're in the lap of luxury. I will. House. Totally, totally. We, we spent a few months on the road in an RV and oh, yeah. we have a pretty small house and it feels like a mansion now. So. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing, is, it's really funny going yeah. with like, like comparisons is, so at Fairbanks where I spent some time, yeah. when I, so I went from Fairbanks eventually to Edmonton. Mm. And so Edmonton is like the most Northern, like main city and it felt so Southern. Like Edmonton compared to Fairbanks, it's like that, these, all these plants that just don't grow North of there. Yeah. So, so not only does like, will things seem bigger, will distances seem easier, yeah. uh, but also everything seems Southern. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I, yeah. yeah. I, I, anybody listening, I, I recommend that the ferry, you know, most yeah. people fly and rent a car, which works great, but of course having your own car and having all your own stuff, yeah. uh, it was also, in, so, cause I just drove a lot. Yeah, I like how you uh, bought the ticket in order to <laughs> yeah. force yourself to do it. Now, did you schedule the Great Lakes Herb Fair in order to come back? I kind of did. <laughs> when I really, so I hate to say this because anybody who organized this will hate me for saying this, <laughs> but I thought, well, I can always cancel. <laughs> but, but you didn't. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I almost, the only time I've ever canceled something is because COVID happened. Right. You know, I'm not one of those. But I did think, I, I, I did want to come home. Yeah. And this is like an amazing stopping off point, like seeing a lot of friends, totally. meeting new people. Yeah. The sun has just come out, which yeah. is nice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, check out, so check out Mason's new oh. amazing tattoo. <laughs> is it botanically correct? So this, so yesterday I went over this, not with my loop because loops don't work for this. A loop is a magnifying glass, but this is a botanically accurate dandelion. Well, I knew I was going to be seeing you the next day, so I was like, I got to make sure it's botanically correct. So. It's true. It's also, so if you don't know much about tattoos, this is what a, a tattoo should look like when it's healing. Like, the colors are beautiful. There's no redness around the edges. I treat 
tattoo infections. So it also looks like Mason will live for another year. At least. Okay, all right. <laughs> Maybe another a shout out 60. Anthony Thielen at Anchors Away Tattoo in Kalamazoo, <laughs> Michigan for doing Anchorage? this. Anchorage? Anchors Away? Anchors Away. Oh, it yeah. sounds like Anchorage. He actually does have a tattoo shop in Alaska too, oh, yeah. coincidentally, but um, he's a childhood friend of mine. So oh, um, nice. yeah, we were best friends in third grade. So. <laughs> wow. But um, Seven Song, thanks for taking the time to be on the Herbalist Hour. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that, of course. That's a lot. It's always, I mean, it's been great knowing you, Mason. Likewise. So yeah, yeah, yeah I feel good about this. I look forward to <laughs> many so more good. years of being your friend. Yes. And... As long as that tattoo heals nicely, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. we should be good as long as uh, I don't get too much older than 65. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll see thanks. you in the next episode. Bye. Thanks so much for watching today's episode of the Herbalist Hour. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want more great herbal content, be sure to subscribe to our Herbrella YouTube channel. Uh, if you enjoy these Herbalist Hour episodes and you'd like to join us live, uh, you can do so by becoming an Herbrella Schoolhouse member. Uh, learn more at herbrella.com slash schoolhouse. And if you want to get your first 30 days for free, use coupon code YouTube30 at checkout. So our Herbrella Schoolhouse members get access to exclusive video classes, monographs, and a lot more more herbal community discounts, um, along with joining these live Herbalist Hour interviews. So one more time, herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. Enter coupon code YouTube30 at checkout to get your first 30 days for free. All right, we'll see you in the next episode and take care.